Somebody lift your hands and magnify the Lord. God is wonderful. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. I appreciate God. He's so good. Ushers, will you come tonight? It's been a good day. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. It doesn't matter what the weather is. Sometimes we can rejoice and be glad anyways. The Bible says, bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God, thou art very great. He's a wonderful God. He's a good God. Sometimes we just need to remember how good God is because a lot of times we get our mind on just how bad the world is. But God's still wonderful. God's still amazing. And He's still a good God. Let's give as God has laid on our hearts tonight. And we're going to pray and ask God to multiply it. Heavenly Father, we love you tonight. We ask as we receive this offering, God, that you'd bless it and you would multiply it and that it be used for your glory. We love you and appreciate it all in Jesus' name. Amen. to her and has come to sing worship God as she comes I bless your name. 
some midnight hour if you should find you're in a prison in your mind just sing out in praise defy those chains and they In Jesus' name. Amen. Young people can go at this time. I'm glad to be in church on Wednesday night. Amen. Amen. I'm glad I've got the victory. Amen. That's one thing you can't afford to lose. They used to say years ago when I was coming up and been in the church about all my life, have you got the victory? If you do and you can say yes, that's something to say because a lot of people today don't have the victory. They don't have the victory over the flesh and over the world and over the devil. But I'm telling you, if you got the victory, you got all three of those conquered. Jesus will give you peace and joy and love. Amen. Everybody stand, if you will, please. Turn in your Bibles to the book of St. John chapter 11. Very familiar chapter in the Word of God. And I feel led to preach on this chapter here tonight. We got to put things in the right perspective. Get things in order. Isaiah told Hezekiah, set your house in order. You're going to die and not live. It's all right if you die as long as it's in order. But I don't want to die out of order because there's only one place to go if you do, and that's to a lake of fire. But if you serve Jesus Christ, he's prepared a mansion for you in the city of God forever and ever. Amen. So in St. John chapter 11, verse 14, let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask for you to help me tonight. As I endeavor to preach your word, let the Holy Ghost come down in this place and touch every person here, save the lost and heal the sick. Move on those that are watching the internet and bless our altar service. Oh God, shut up. I'm leaning on you tonight, Father. We trust you to help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. Amen. Just one verse of scripture. In St. John chapter 11 and verse 14. Then Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Let me read that one more time. St. John chapter 11 and verse 14. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. I want to minister tonight on a subject from death to life. From death to life. And you could be seated if you will, please. I've preached on this chapter many, many times over the years that I've been preaching. And I suppose this chapter is one of the chapters that most preachers have preached on many times. Because it is a chapter that produces Death and it produces life. From death to life. Jesus had come to a man by the name of Lazarus and he had a sister's 
her two sisters by the name of Martha and Mary, and he became very friendly with them. And they had on occasions been with Jesus. He had been to their house, and they knew Jesus well, and Jesus, of course, knew them well. And it was that same Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair. And therefore, the Bible said that she sent, or they sent to Jesus because Lazarus was sick and very sick, and they were troubled. And Jesus said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. And the Bible said, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. He wasn't in a hurry. He wasn't looking to heal Lazarus from sickness, he was looking to do a greater miracle to raise him from the dead. And sometimes when Jesus doesn't come right away, we get troubled and we think he's not coming, but he knows and understands who you are. He knew who Lazarus was and he was concerned about him being sick, but he didn't get in a hurry. Stayed two more days where he was. And then after that, he said to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. And the disciples said, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone you. And are you going there again? They're probably waiting on you to come back into town. They want to kill you. And I want you to know there's a lot of people want to kill Jesus. But he's still Jesus. He's still Savior. He's still King. And nobody can bring him down. So you're going back to Judea again. They'll want to stone you. They were trying to before. But he said, are not there 12 hours in a day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth because there's no light in him. He said, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I'm going to go to awake him out of sleep. They said, well, if he's asleep, why are you worried about him? They thought he would... Jesus was talking about resting in sleep. But he wasn't talking about resting in sleep. He was simply telling them that Lazarus was dead. So he said in our text of St. John eleven fourteen, 14, Lazarus is dead and I'm glad for your sakes that I wasn't there to the intent that you might believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. And Thomas, which was called Didymus, he said, we can go with him and we'll die with him. So Thomas had death on his mind. Jesus had life on his mind. And I want to tell you, Jesus is life. He's not a God of the dead. He's a God of the living. And he wants you to be alive. He doesn't want you to be dead in trespasses and sin, living for the devil. He wants you to be alive. So he says plainly, Lazarus is dead. And then Jesus came and found that he would, had been dead for four days and and uh, Jerusalem was nigh unto Bethany where Lazarus was about eight miles. It said 15 furlongs off. That's eight miles from Jerusalem where Jesus was going. And many of the Jews had come to Mary and to Martha to comfort them concerning their brother Lazarus. Just like when we come together, it hurts us. Many of you have taken loved ones down to the grave and had their body lowered in the ground and you leave there crying and you're troubled because there's a separation. But it's not an eternal separation. It's just for a season. If they die in the Lord, blessed are they which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. So they're going to be with the Lord and if we know Jesus Christ, we're gonna see him again. There's going to be a great reunion day after a while. And I'm glad I'm part of it. I'm glad that I'm thinking about heaven and I'm not thinking about hell. I don't like to talk about hell. I don't even like to preach on it. But sometimes we have to do that. Jesus preached about it. But I love to preach about heaven. Because heaven is a wonderful place. The devil's not going to be there. There'll be no pain in heaven, no tears, no sorrow, no negatives. Everything about heaven is going to be wonderful. You don't see that in this world. But there's a land that's fairer than day, and by faith we can look out and see it afar. I believe heaven's a real place. And I'm looking forward to going there. So they were concerned. 
Uh, the Jews came and comforted them in their mourning about the death of Lazarus. And Martha, Lazarus' sister, as soon as, soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet Jesus. I want to tell you the first one that you ought to want to see when you're in trouble is Jesus. But many times we go the other direction. We try to rely upon man. We want to call Dr. Smith or Dr. Jones, and there's nothing wrong with that. But there's a great physician. There's a bomb in Gilead. There's a healer of mankind. There's a savior you could call on him, and I'll pray to him till I die. Regardless of what I see, I'm going to call on Jesus. I'm going to call on him first. She went to meet Jesus, but Mary stayed in the house. She wasn't as concerned maybe as Martha. I don't know why. She stayed in the house. Don't know the reason. But Mary stayed in the house. But Martha came to Jesus and said, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus said, your brother shall rise again. She said, I know he will. At the resurrection day, at the last day, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me. Though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, that should come into the world. And so Jesus settled the fact. I'm the resurrection. You're looking at him. You can't have a resurrection without Jesus. There would be no great resurrection if he hadn't got up out of the tomb on the third day. Stretch out his hands and said, Oh, death, where's your sting? Oh, grave, where's your victory? He brought deliverance. He brought life. He conquered death, hell, and the grave. And so he says to Martha, You're looking at him. Aren't you glad that when you got saved, he is life and he's putting life in you? That's a reason you can raise your hands. That's a reason you can shout and praise God. You're alive. You're alive in Jesus Christ. So Martha, after she had had her little encounter with Jesus, went to Mary at the house and said, The master is come and calleth for thee. Aren't you glad that one day when you were stooped in sin, bound in iniquity, dead and without life, the master came? He came on time. He didn't come when they wanted him to, but he don't come because we just bid him to come. He has everything in control. Everything's in his hands. He knows what he's doing in your dilemma. He knows how to bring you through your trial. He knows how to help you in the midst of your trouble. He's Jesus. He's king. He's Lord. So here he is, and Martha says, a master's come. He's calling for you. Mary didn't waste any time. She got up immediately and she went to where Jesus was and Jesus had not come yet in the town but where Martha had met him. She met him on his way in. That let me know that you can't put all the responsibility on Jesus. You got to get up. You got to go to where he is. He comes but you got to have a position where you're getting up and you're going to come to where he is. He's not going to do it all. He'll show up, but you got to make a move. You have to make a move toward him in faith and toward him in repentance and toward him in in surrender. Everything about you must be given unto him, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. you got to move toward Jesus. My God, I'm feeling pressure more than ever have, and you are too. But I'm not going to sit down and let the devil beat the daylights out of me. I'm going to Jesus. I might have to pray more than I have. I may have to study more than I have. But I'm going to Jesus. How come? He's the only one can help me. You might get temporal help from man, but it won't last. But if you get Jesus, you'll get eternal help. You'll get help that will last you forever because he deals in everlasting terms. So Mary got up to go to Jesus. She knew he could help her. And the Jews that were mourning there with them and comforting them, they followed her. And they said she's going to the grave. No, she's not going to the grave. She's going to see Jesus. When I got saved, I didn't go to the grave. The grave represents death. It represents sadness. It represents brokenness, a broken heart, and and all of these negatives that goes with it. But Jesus represents life and joy and peace and happiness. He has it all to give unto us. 
So she's going to meet Jesus. And she says the same thing that Martha said. She fell down at Jesus' feet and said, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. It was over. Death has a claim on you. It's over. We have uh, doctors pronounce our loved ones dead. We just, get, we just turn the book over and, and turn the page and turn the cover over, close the book. It's over. It's final. It's, it. it's ended. But not with Jesus. Not when he comes. Nothing's over when he comes. I don't care what kind of situation you're in. Jesus is a conqueror of all things. He can help you when nobody else can. And oh my, if there's ever a day that we got to refocus on him and realize we don't want him standing at the door and knocking to get in. We want him in here. We want him in the choir and the band. We want him in the worship. We want Jesus in everything we do. And we couldn't preach enough on him. He's worthy of our message. He's worthy of our prayers. He's worthy of our song. He's worthy of our commitment. If you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Still, their mind's on death. But I'm preaching on from death to life. Jesus is going to change the whole circumstance. He's going to wipe away the tears. He's going to take away all the sadness that has accompanied them in this sad time and this bereaving news that they have received about Lazarus being dead. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews weeping that came with her, he groaned in the spirit. And he said, where have you laid him? They said, come and see. Don't you want Jesus to come and see? He sees it before he gets there. But don't you want him to come and see? Where have you laid him? Come and see. Jesus wept. And the Bible said, the Jews said, behold how he loved him. Could not this man that opened the eyes of the blind had been here that, that Lazarus would not have died? Their mind is still on death. But I'm talking about from death unto life. Life has come and things are going to change. If you can get to Jesus, your circumstance will change. I don't care if you need money. He can put money in your pocket. I don't care if everything's upside down. He can put it right side up. He can take everything that you're facing and make it good. Because when he made it all, in the beginning, the Bible said God saw it and it was good. He's a good God. He cares for you more than you could ever care for him. So Jesus wept. And they said, he opened the eyes of the blind. He could have been here that Lazarus wouldn't have died. Jesus is grown in his, again in the spirit. And said, where have you laid him? And the Bible said uh, that before he came to the grave, it was a cave and a stone was upon it. That meant it was troublesome. The stone is there and it's probably heavy. And it's there because Lazarus has been dead for four days and he decomposition has set in. His body's beginning to rot. Now it's too late. Four days he's dead. There's a stone over the grave. Jesus said, take away the stone. Now notice, he didn't do it all. He gave them some responsibility. And I'm telling you, if you're going to serve God, you can't put all of it on God. You say, well, God's a God of grace and God is good and God will do that and Jesus will do that. He's waiting for you to do some things. He's waiting for you to live right and pray and fast and study the word and be obedient unto him. When he tells you to do something, he's waiting on you to get involved. So Jesus looks at the grave they roll the stone away, but before they do, Martha says, he stinketh but now. Martha, Jesus said, what have I told you? If you believe, you'd see the glory of God. Don't you understand who's talking to you? Don't you remember the blinded eyes I opened? Don't you remember the lepers that I've cleansed? Don't you remember the dead that I've raised? Don't you remember who I am? And sometimes our circumstance is so uh, severe till we forget who he is. Oh, God, you're looking at a preacher right now. I've been searching my heart. I've been calling on God. I've got to have Jesus, and Jesus will put you in a circumstance sometimes where he's the only one can help you, but you've got to get up, and you've got to help yourself. 
They had to roll away the stone, but he stinketh but now. There's an odor about him. That's why they put him in the tomb. But that didn't make any difference to Jesus. They took away the stone from the place where Lazarus was laid and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me and I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it that they may believe that thou hast sent me. Now he included the Father. He didn't take all the glory. He wanted them to know he came from the Father. And I'm doing this, and you hear me always, but I'm doing this so they'll know as I pray right now and I talk to you, they'll know you're involved in this. Let me tell you something, church. The Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, the triune Godhead is looking out for you. You've got three dynamic individuals that are eternal, that are pure and holy, never sinned, looking out for you. And then you've got angels because the Bible said the angels of the Lord encamp about those that fear God. Then you've got the word of God. Then you've got the church, your brothers and sisters hoovering over you in prayer and trying to help you along the journey. Everything is for you. God, the, the apostle Paul said, if God be for us, who could be against us? Everything's for you. So they rolled away the stone. And when they had done so, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. He come a-crawling out of that tomb, right up in the presence of the people, bound hand and foot, and a napkin was about his face. And Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Now notice, he came out from the dead. Life is in him, but he still has grave clothes on. Those grave clothes represent death. They represent sin. They represent corruption. He's got on grave clothes, not just clothes for the living, but clothes for the dead. Get them off of him. Loose him and let him go. Let me tell you, the world will bind you. The things of the world will take you down. If you're clothed in carnality and you're clothed with the things of this world, you're not going to be having any part with Jesus. Jesus says, I've given him life now. Get those great clothes off of him. He don't need them anymore. Clothe him in righteousness. Clothe him with the clothes of life. I want to tell you, when Jesus Jesus got a hold of you. He brought life into you, but he delivered you from the flesh and the world and the devil, and you don't belong to sin anymore. You don't resemble that world. You don't act like that world. You don't talk like that world. You don't dress like that world. You're pure and holy. You're separated. Jesus says now he's got life. He's got to change his garments. He took the old garment off of me the old garment of carnality and flesh and lust, and he ripped it off. When life come in, it couldn't stay on. The devil can't not stay where life is. They gave him a new garment. And many of the people believed on Jesus and the Jews when he did this great thing. The Bible said many of the Jews which came to Mary and seen the things which Jesus did believed on him, but some of them went and reported it to the Pharisees. Everybody is not going to receive this life. Everybody will not receive a holiness message. Everybody doesn't want the word of God. Everybody's not going to live at that cross. Everybody's not going to take up that cross. But to everybody that does, there is life and there is victory and there is power in the Holy Ghost. I want to take up what Jesus told me to take up. I want to put on what he gives and I want to take off what the devil gives. So the Pharisees, they reported what was happening. What did the Pharisees? They got so mad about Jesus until they wanted to kill him. They would have killed him if they could. But then the Bible tells us in the 12th chapter, let me finish now, uh, this cha these chapters a, a little bit, and I'll continue on with the message. In the 12th chapter, the Bible tells us six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Lazarus' house, and they had a supper. Now they've got life. He's alive now, 
He's changed garments. He's got on the clothes of righteousness and life that represents life. And he's there at home. And six days before the Passover, Jesus shows up and they have a supper. I want to tell you, when God delivers you, there's a table spread for you and you can eat with Jesus. Ha, ha, ha. My goodness. Lazarus is there and Martha is serving and, and uh, Mary took a pound of ointment of spikered and costly and anointed the feet with Jesus and wiped them with her hair. She wanted to do more than just eat with him. She wanted to minister to him. I want to tell you, a lot of people want to come to church to eat, but they don't want to minister. Come on now. If you love Jesus, you're going to do more than just come to church and eat. You're going to put oil on him. You're going to wipe his uh, uh, feet with the hairs of your head, spiritually speaking. You want to be close to him. You want him to smell well. Because the Bible said when she put that ointment upon him, the spike nerd is very costly. The house was filled with the odor of the ointment. When we fall in love with Jesus and we want to do more than just eat, Martha was eating with him, but she wasn't just wanting to eat with him. She wanted to do more. Or Murray, that is, excuse me. She wanted to do more. So she anointed him, and the odor filled the house. I want to tell you, when we minister unto Jesus, and we praise him, and we worship him, and we come to the house of God to glorify his name, the odor is going to fill the house. I've had many people all over the years come into this church, and people that are not members here, and they don't come to church here. They say, as soon as I walk in the door, I can feel the presence of God. You know why? You're doing more than eating. You're ministering. You came to church to fill up and get vitality and spiritual nourishment so you can let God use you to minister to somebody, to do a work for God. People that all they want to do is eat, they're going to come over spiritually overweight. Get in trouble. If you'll minister to him and you'll love him, the odor of God, the beautiful smell, the fragrance of heaven, will fill the house. And the Bible said when this happened, Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, he was a hypocrite. He didn't like it because that, that uh, ointment was put on Jesus, that spikenard. He didn't like it. He could smell the same aroma that everybody else could, but he's complaining. I want to tell you, everybody that comes to the house of God's not going to speak well. There's going to be a few complainers. There's going to be a few negative people that didn't come to church to get blessed, didn't come to smell the ointment, didn't come to feast with Jesus, didn't come to minister to him. They come and they got their mind on something beside Jesus. Judas is concerned more about the ointment than he is Jesus. Oh, my God. So he says, why was this waste? It could have been sold for 300 pence and give to the poor. Jesus rebuked him. The Bible said he said this, uh, not that he cared for the poor, but it said because he was a thief and he had the bag and bear what was put in the bag, he wanted the money. Jesus said, let her alone. Against the day of my burying hath she kept this for the poor. Always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. I'm more important than the ointment. I'm more important than the money. Judas had its mind on carnal, materialistic things. The person Jesus is the one we need to have our mind on. When we go to church, filter everything out of your mind. Don't be thinking things bad. Don't think about some kind of fault you've got or thinking about somebody you might have a little something against. Get it out of your mind. Get pure where you can anoint Jesus. He will be there to bless you. So what a great miracle. And because of this, the Bible said much of the Jews, they believed on Jesus Christ, but much people, the Jews, knew that he was there and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but to see Lazarus. They wanted Lazarus to tell them what it was like on the other side. <laughs> You got these books they write and they talk about and some of them tell about the same things. I don't know. I'm not putting credence in that. I put my credence in the word of God. Anybody could write a book and make up a story and get rich. They write books. They go on television, tell about dying, afterlife. Well, I, some of those things could be real. I'm not saying they're not. 
But they're, they're talking about after life. These people want to know about life. Say, hey, Lazarus, what happened to you those four days? Where was you? Is there an afterlife? Is there any uh, life beyond the grave? They're talking to Lazarus about this. But the chief priest consulted, consulted they might put Lazarus to dead because the Jews followed Jesus on account of Lazarus' miracle. That's the reason the church needs to be in a place where we can have miracles and God can move so people can see God not only through the preaching of the word, not only through the melodious songs that we sing, but because Jesus is saving the lost, he's healing the sick, he's raising people up, things are happening, people can say God is in that church, and if they're hungry, they can find food. If they're distraught, they can find deliverance. If they're down, they can be lifted. They can come to where Jesus is, and something's gonna happen where Jesus is. There's some things that we learn about this passage of these two scriptures here, these two chapters. These things are still present, prevalent in the ministry of Christ even today. Jesus showed certain characteristics in raising Lazarus from the dead and he still has those same traits today. The natural raising of Lazarus goes over into the spiritual realm of Christ today. For the next few moments, I won't be real long, just the next few moments, I want us to observe these attitudes of Jesus and realize he's still in business. From death to life, he's still raising the dead. He's still healing the sick. He's still Jesus. Oh man, that's enough to make me want to preach till midnight. He's still Jesus. The same one who walked the shores of Galilee. The same one who walked the streets of Jerusalem. The same one who confounded people with the words that went out of his mouth. The same one that raised up the dead and healed all kinds of sickness and disease. Cleansed the leper and opened blinded eyes. He's still in business. He's here for you. Amen. He's raising men and women from death to life even now. You were dead, some of you, a few years ago. I think about some of you, and I could name you some of them. Of you weren't even raised in a Pentecostal church. You didn't know anything about the Holy Ghost. But God convicted you and got a hold of you, and you started speaking in tongues, and you didn't even hardly know what it was. It was God. Because you had an encounter with Jesus. That's what the church needs more than anything. It's all right to have programs and things of that nature if they're, if they're okay in some places or not to try and incorporate uh, the, the, the world with the church and run them together. They can't mix. Just like oil and water can't mix. It won't work. You're either on the Lord's side or you're on the devil's side. You can't serve two masters. You're either going to serve the Lord or serve the devil. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. you got to make up your mind who you're going to serve. I settled the old account a long time ago. As for me, me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. Jesus knew Lazarus was dead in verse 11 through 14. They didn't know it until he died. But Jesus wasn't there, and he still knew he was dead. He told his disciples that Lazarus was asleep and they thought he was speaking of rest, but he simply said plainly in our text, Lazarus is dead. People won't always be aware of a person's condition, but Jesus knows everything about them. You could come into church here tonight and not know what that person's facing, but there's not a person that walked in these doors that Jesus didn't know everything you went through today. I don't know where you was at two o'clock, but he does. <laughs> I was laying on a chiropractor table about, uh, let's see, it was about 10, 15, 10, 30, and I thought he was going to kill me. <laughs> I'm still alive. My chiropractor wasn't there. This guy's a lot tougher. I mean, he, he, he straightened me out. It hurt for a while, but sometimes you don't get any good until it hurts. I don't want to hurt, preacher. I don't want to hurt, but sometimes it hurts to get right. Pain. No pain, no gain. 
My God, I don't have to. He wants to put me through the ringer. If it'll bring me on the other side, so be it. Whatever he does to me, I lay myself on the altar. I give myself to Jesus Christ. He's the Lord and master of my life. And he knows everything about me. He knows every hair that fell from my head and every one of yours too. He knows if you're dead or alive, you can't hide it from him. Save or lost. People in church may not know what you are. You may go out of here and go to some adult place and pornography. You may be getting it on the telephone. You may be watching it uh, on the uh, screen there and, and, and doing those things. And you may come into church and shout just like everybody else. But he knows and saw you when you went into that place. He knows when you got it on the telephone. He knows when you're sneaking off and doing something. Don't want anybody to know it. He knows everybody that's here. The Bible said in Isaiah 39 and 2, Thou knowest my down setting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. The Bible said in Hebrews 4 and 13, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. He knows it all. Job said in Job 23 and 10, But he knoweth the way that I take when he hath tried me. I shall come forth of gold. You haven't faced anything that Jesus doesn't know about. You're not, my, I feel like preaching here tonight. You're not going through anything that he can't help you with. He's been in business a long time. He has all the experience and he knows how to heal. He knows how to help help you out of your dilemma. Just don't give up. Don't give out. Don't give in. Hold on to the precious arm of Jesus Christ. There's coming a payday someday. I believe it at my hotel. I believe it as sure as I'm standing here preaching to you today. If we can endure for a little longer, if we can hold on a little longer, there's going to be a payday someday for the saints of God. Amen. We're going to leave here. St. John 6 and 30 said, Now we are sure that thou knowest all things. Job said in Job 31 and 4, Doth not he see my ways and count all my steps? Job 34 and 21, For his eyes are upon the ways of man, and he seeth all his goings. 1 John 3 and 24, For our heart condemneth God is greater than our heart, and knoweth all things. He knows it all. He knew Lazarus was dead. He knew that Lazarus needed to be raised. Jesus was concerned about his death. He wanted him to live. He didn't take the death of Lazarus lightly. He was moved with compassion toward that family and toward Lazarus. Listen, Jesus wants to give you life more than you want life. That's the reason he convicts you of your sins and makes you feel bad so you'll have a desire to repent. He calls you to repentance even after you're saved if you do something wrong and you got the baptism of the Holy Ghost and God is speaking through you. He's going to convict you when you fall short. He's going to lift you up. Jesus doesn't take the spiritual death like the sinner does. He don't take it lightly. He's concerned about those who are dead in sin. Hebrews 4 and 15, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He is touched. In Matthew 23 and 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often have I gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. He was compassionate to Israel, and they refused to receive him. Jesus did something about it. He knew his condition. He was concerned about his condition, and he did something about it. He brought deliverance. He was concerned. He raised him up. In St. John 11 and 43, and when he had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. There was a day when you were dead in sin and he came to your house. He brought conviction to you and he said, Susie, come forth. I don't even know if any Susie's in here or not. I made her up. Brenda, come forth. Alexander, come forth. Hester, come forth. Julian. He did it in 1994. He pulled you. 
He took death. You were full of death. You were full of death. Every one of you that are sitting on these pews that know Jesus Christ, death claimed you, but he called you by name and he said, come forth. Brother, your name was written down in heaven and you're going to be ready when the rapture takes place. When Jesus comes, if you go to the grave, you're getting up out of the grave. You're going to have a brand new body. If you're alive, you're going to be transformed in a moment of time and this corruptible is going to put on green corruption. This mortal is going to put on immortality. Then we be about to pass a scene is written, death is swallowed up in victory. He'll swallow up death. He'll take it away. He'll give you life and with life comes joy. With with life comes peace. With life comes the blessings of God. With life comes eternal heaven. You're not going to go to hell, but you're going to heaven because you have passed from death unto life. Amen. Jesus lives in you. He's still doing something about death today in Ephesians 2 and 1. Give me about three more minutes. Ephesians 2 and 1. And you have the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. That word mean quicken, mean to be made alive. You haven't lived till you know the Lord. These people taking these drugs and drinking this alcohol and all of these, unsexu- these sexual things that are ungodly, all of these things, there's no peace in that. There's no life in that. He quickened you from that. He gave you life. In 1 John 3, 13 and 14, marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. And last of all, if we pass from death unto life, we're going to go into rapture. <laughs> Woo! I've been thinking about all this stuff. I've been hearing these politicians, some of them. I don't listen to them a whole lot because most of them make me mad. <laughs> They're full of the devil. They don't love this country. But I'm a Patriot, I love it. I love the United States. I love what I was brought up in. It's the greatest country in the world then, but it's in a mess now. And you hear me preach, I don't get on that. But the rapture's going to take place. I'm not looking for a hole in the ground. I'm looking for a hole in the sky. (laughs) Brother, you live in Simpsonville, South Carolina. Is that right? I got Simpsonville on your card. Oh, okay. That's okay. I'm not denying you. I'm getting the truth out of you. Amen. (laughs) Well, how far is that from here? An hour and a half. We're glad to have you. He's a man of God. Listen to me. Um, It don't make no difference if you're in Simpsonville or if you're out on an island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. When the rapture takes place, you're coming out of there. (laughs) Man, I feel God. Whoo! It's going to be worth it. I have a lot of things happen to me, and you do too, and I'm not going to magnify those negatives. I'm going to build up Jesus. I can't afford to let my spirit get down because of a mess going on. I got to keep my eyes on the eastern skies. I got to keep my eyes on heaven. Jesus is coming, and he said he's prepared a place for us, and we're going to go to that place. We pass from death unto life. I am the Lord. I am life. I live. And because I live, you shall live also. Don't threat because of evildoers. Don't fear. Keep the fire burning. Keep your eyes looking toward heaven. For I will soon appear. You're mine. You're the apple of my eye. And I'll claim you as my own. Just hold on, hold on, hold on. Saith the Lord. Everybody stand, if you would, please. Oh, God, from death to life, from death to life, very familiar scripture. The Lord wanted me to preach this in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus shall God bring with him. Amen. We're going to make it. Jesus called the name of Lazarus and raised him up to life. He's calling you this night. 
If you're lost and you don't know Jesus, he's calling you to salvation. If you're a Christian, he's calling you to commitment. He's calling you to do more. Listen to me. I want you to hear me. We're going to pray. When we see these things, it ought to stir us up. It ought not discourage us. It's a sign of the time. Jesus is saying, it won't be long. Woo! It won't be long. There's people standing right here in this church right now. It's very possible that you'll never die. That's how close it is. Can you imagine what's going to happen if that nut over there in North Korea releases one of those, uh, what do you call it, chemical, what do they call them things? Huh? Nuclear, nuclear. I, I know it. I just get my mind there for a moment, brother. But I'd know it if I felt one. <laughs> Tell me within 45 minutes, everybody be dead. I mean a big crowd. And he's just a little, little worm, that's all he is. Nothing. But our Jesus is everything. Are we going to fear some little puny man whose breath is in him and God gives him his breath? Put not your trust in princes, nor in the son of the man in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth. In that very day his thoughts perish. God don't fear man fear God fear Jesus <laughs> I want you to come to this altar and just get out and pray to him tell him how much you love him and if you need a salvation and you're lost come tonight we're so glad to see you here's a good crowd here tonight appreciate you being here you're ready you've passed from death unto life you love the brethren. You're not talking about everybody. You're keeping your tongue sanctified by the blood. And you're doing what's right in the sight of the Lord. And you have a right to say it. The Bible said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Woo! Thank God for Brother David. Thank God for Brother Ronnie. One of these days, Brother Ronnie, I'd like to see God heal you, and he can. Don't know why I don't. I don't. I prayed for your healing. But if he doesn't, you're not going to need this wheelchair. Did you hear me? <laughs> you're going to be just like me. You've been confined to a wheelchair all these years, but one of these days, you won't need it. Oh, my God, bless my brothers. Bless my brothers, every one of them in this altar. Thank you for them. Thank you for them, God. Help them to pray and seek the face of God. And we want to always remember, God, we've got prayer meeting on Thursday night. We want people to come and pray, God. I believe if they'll do it and we get to praying like we ought to, we're going to see souls saved. We're going to see people sanctified and baptized in the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. We're going to see God move upon everybody if we'll pray and seek the face of God. It's wonderful. Thank you for it, Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. Woo! Thank you for Jesus. Thank you, Father. Bless this couple. Proud of them, God. Woo! <laughs> God, brother, you got fire set up in your bones. <laughs> it's eternal fire. Blessed fire. Bless my sister, God. We appreciate her so much. We do, God, all of these sisters and all of these brothers and these preachers and everybody here, God. My precious son, this precious brother, God, right here, came from South Carolina. He's a good man. Bless him. Anoint him in the Holy Ghost. Woo! <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Woo! Touch my brother, God. Touch my sister. My God, let the fire burn. Touch Brother Cliff. He's a good man. He loves you, God got a wonderful spirit about him the spirit of Christ pull him closer to you and let him receive what you want him to have in Jesus name I pray Woo, touch her Jesus bless her family God her children and her in-laws and her uh, sisters and her relatives bless sister Debbie heal her body Woo, <laughs> she loves you thank you father thank you father God said your choice I have chosen you you've been faithful to me and you've let your light shine and I am going to bless you 
You're going to see my glory. I'm going to bless you abundantly, saith the Lord. Woo! <laughs> Woo! He's going to do it. He's going to do it for this little brother right here. He's as important as I am. He don't have the ministry I've got, but he's just as important to God. God don't have respect to persons. We do sometimes, but not God. He loves everybody. He even loves me <laughs> with all my problems. Aren't you glad you know him tonight? Aren't you glad you've got a burden for Jesus? It's God. And I don't care what the devil does. Jesus will provide. God will provide. You hear me. I want you to hear this. If you don't get anything else before you leave here tonight, God will provide. Woo! Here's a couple right here. They're really hungry. They've been a coming here and they've been shouting and praising God, getting in that altar every service. They're hungry. Hungry. You keep hunger. You keep hunger. You'll see something. You're no different than I am. He knows when you were born. I believe he was born the same year I am, so you're a pretty good person. You too, I think. We're the same year born. But that don't have anything to do spirituality. I'm just cutting up a little bit. But aren't you glad for Jesus? I'm telling you, I'm glad I know him. But more than that, he knows me. He knows me. You may miscalculate about me, but he doesn't. He knows me. He don't want to hurt me. It may hurt for him to help me, but he don't want to hurt me. Hurt brings victory. He takes care of it all. Bless him, Lord. My God, move on him now. Raise your hands and praise him. Stand up here, sister. I want to say something to you. I'm going to tell you something. You don't fear nothing. God's already answered your prayers. You've been praying for years. He's already answered them. It's just a time. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. He's already hurt you. Just wanted me to tell you that. You've been praying. He's already hurt you. Now give him the praise for it, okay? Give him the praise for it. I'm talking about from now on, you praise him. He's already hurt you. You've been praying. He's already hurt you. I don't know nothing about it, but God does. Whoo. <laughs> He's good. He's so good. Ain't he good? You pass from death unto life. My God. No wonder he shouts like he does. No wonder you shout like you do. There's fire shut up in your bones. Now stand and raise your hand and praise him for the message in the service tonight. Praise him with all your heart. Father, thank you for what we felt here tonight. The good crowd, the good people. They're good people, God. All of them, every one of them. I don't have an all against anybody. They love you, and I thank God for them. I thank you for our church. I thank you for the buildings you've given us. I thank you for the finances. I thank you for the blessings of Calvary. I thank you for the Holy Ghost power. I thank you for the message. I thank you for the altars. I thank you for the band. I thank you for the choir, the special singers. I thank you, God, for all you've done for me. Amen. <laughs> it's real. It's real. Woo! <laughs> my God aren't you glad for the word that's a powerful chapter I preached on it a lot but I enjoyed preaching on it tonight from death to life have a good week prayer meeting tomorrow night prayer meeting tomorrow night prayer meeting tomorrow night 7 o'clock same time same station God bless you have a wonderful time if you need anything just let me know Amen. I love you.